Well, welcome into our study. I see some of you logged in. There'll be more to come, and some of you will watch us on um, on tape, I guess I'd say. But uh, glad to have you with us. I'm going to start a new study this evening. Um, as I was preparing this, I thought, uh, man, how great it would be to be able to to sit and, and, and talk with you face to face about it and have some back and forth. Uh, there's several questions that I ask throughout this opening lesson that I'd really like to hear from you on. But um, well, sooner rather than later, we'll get to do that. But we're gonna uh, do the best we can in this format for now. So we um, opening a new study uh, I've, I've entitled it <clears throat> very uncreatively, On Peace. So we're talking about a, a topic that I think a lot of people have it on their mind. Um, as I work with people, um, I hear them yearning for this. Um, maybe because of something going on in their life, in their family, in the world. Um, might be in a lot of places where they just feel they want to experience peace as opposed to what they're currently experiencing. And so I thought it was timely for us to think about really what what is peace? Uh, what does that word mean? Um, and not just in, in the way it's defined in our world, but what it really means. Where do we find peace and how do we maintain it? And so those are some of the common questions that we expect to, to ask and answer when we're discussing something like this. And so that's, that's where we're headed and we'll be searching some scriptures this evening and in coming weeks on this. Uh, but I thought maybe the best place to begin was a basic point um, really for the entire study and that is that the you know peace when you ask people to define peace a lot of times they will define it by talking about the absence of something that is peace is you know it's usually thought of as the absence of something uh, Maybe, for instance, they'll say peace is when there's no war. So the absence of war is peace. Or they might say the absence of some other kind of conflict, uh, fight or whatever is peace. Or they might even say something like um, the absence of bad times or arguments, whatever it might be. Okay, so they, they define it in terms of absence. I looked it up in uh, sort of a standard dictionary online today, and uh, the way they define peace was freedom from disturbances. So again, it's the absence of something, the absence of disturbances. And then a secondary def definition that they offered was um, what we've already talked about, no war or, or the end of war. Uh, and so that's that's a common way we think of it, uh, you know, in in day to day basis. But if we're we're thinking about peace from a a spiritual or biblical perspective, um, limiting limiting our definition to those is pretty big mistake and um, really wrong from a biblical perspective. So. Uh, the basic point I wanted to start with, and it's really undergirds the entire study, I think we'll see as we go through different aspects of this, is that, that peace is not the absence of something from a biblical perspective. Um, it is not the absence of whatever it is that's bothering us, war, fights, bad times, whatever, sickness, whatever it might be. Peace is not the absence of something. It is rather the presence of someone. 
from a biblical perspective, um, peace is about presence, not absence. And if that isn't, isn't clear, we'll try and make it clear as we look at the scriptures together. Well, let me just restate that because perhaps I garbled it as I, as I went on about it there. Peace is not the absence of something, biblically speaking, but it is rather the presence of someone. So let's, let's begin this by looking at some biblical texts, some, some examples of what I'm trying to say here. And let's start out in, uh, in Luke chapter 8. You'll notice uh, that each of these passages we'll look at tonight, and there's four of them. There's two in the Gospel of Luke and two in the Gospel of John. Uh, all of them will have the word peace in them in some, some way, some fashion. And, uh, of course, that's intentional in our opening study. But in Luke chapter 8... <clears throat> it's during Jesus's ministry and um, and probably a pretty familiar story to you beginning down at verse 22 just a few verses here Luke 8 verse 22 it says one day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them let us go across to the other side of the lake so they set out and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him. Now notice, let me interject here. Um, there's this storm going on, and Jesus remains asleep. I don't think it's just because he's a sound sleeper. But they go and they, they woke him, it says in verse 24, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even winds and water, and they obey him? So you're familiar with that story told in several of the Gospels. Uh, but we read the, the account here in Luke 8. As you think about that story that you probably have a lot of experience with, why is it that Jesus rebukes them? Why, why is it that he rebukes their faith? Uh, and from the perspective of what we're, the angle we're coming at it from, uh, you think about, again, Jesus is in the boat with the disciples. This great storm comes. He's sleeping. He doesn't wake up. They wake him up. They think they're about to die, about to go underwater. And that, despite the fact that in the boat with them is the Prince of Peace, who has already demonstrated multiple times his great power to them. They've witnessed his signs, his miracles, his works of power. And he's there in the boat with them, and yet they, they're convinced they're about to die. And so he rebukes their faith. And, um, and so, you know, if you were in the boat with Jesus, don't you think that you would have some peace? That you would have some security about the situation, yet they're struggling with that. I don't doubt I would have too, but we understand that here, here is the Prince of Peace in the boat with them. And yet they have no peace within. In the other accounts uh, that the other gospel writers tell this story, you'll remember that when uh, Jesus rebukes the winds and the waves, he says, peace, be still. And uh, Luke actually doesn't include that, that saying of the Lord in this but the others do. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not a coincidence that he uses that word. Peace be still. So they get a rebuke here and hopefully learn um, something additional about the Lord. But you'll notice at the end of the story, they're still shaken up, shaken up about it uh, because 
of the incredible power he displays. You know, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Uh, they're still struggling to come, come to uh, an understanding of what he's trying to offer them. The second passage is in the 19th chapter of Luke. Luke 19 and beginning at verse 41. So when we get all the way to the 19th chapter of Luke, of course, we're very close to the time of the cross and um, Jesus in, in what we're going to read has, has come near Jerusalem. Remember, he, he comes to the city and eventually uh, later that week he's arrested um, and crucified. But in verse 41, it says, And when he drew near and saw the city, the city of Jerusalem, that is, he wept over it. Um, that famous verse in John, you know, that we always say the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. It's not the only place where it's described that, that the Lord shed tears. He weeps over Jerusalem here in 19th chapter of Luke, verse 41. But he, he wept over the city, it says, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. So Jesus, as he comes within view of the city and sees it, uh, he makes this, this statement he, as if he's speaking to the city as a whole, almost like the city is a person. And he weeps over it and, and he makes this statement, would that you had known the things that make for peace. Well, as you think about what he says there, what was it or what was the thing that makes for peace that Jesus refers to? Well, clearly it's Jesus. It's he himself. He's the thing that makes for peace, just like should have been with the disciples in the boat during the storm. Now, as he speaks over Jerusalem and prophesies about the fact that they're soon going to be surrounded by armies and be torn down, not one stone left upon another, um, he says, if you had only known the things that make for peace, what is that? Well, that's him. If they had only accepted him, if they had only turned to him for deliverance, for salvation, they had rejected him and would continue to do so uh, until they put him on a cross. Um, you know, why were all these awful things going to happen to Jerusalem? Uh, this has sadly become uh, a controversial point uh, among some Bible teachers to, to make the point that Jesus made in this text that the reason Jerusalem eventually is destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 AD is the fact that they rejected their Savior. They rejected Jesus. And he makes that clear here in, in the 44th verse um, when he, you know, he says, they will not leave one stone upon another in you and then he says, why? Because you did not know the time of your visitation. That is, you didn't recognize that I had come and, and offered you salvation. They had, they had rejected. They had, not, they had not known the things that make for peace. You see, peace is not the absence of something. It's the presence of someone. It's the presence of the Lord. It's Jesus. Jesus is the, the basis for peace. And uh, this is one illustration of this idea. 
as he weeps over Jerusalem in Luke chapter 19. The last two texts I want us to think about are in the Gospel of John. So we're, we're going to start in John the 16th chapter. John 16, and uh, we'll read just a few verses beginning in verse 31. But to sort of set the stage here, what's going on in this section of John, there's this long section in the middle of John. It runs from near the end of chapter 13 all the way through the end of chapter 17, where Jesus is with his disciples the night um, that he'll be betrayed, the night before he's arrested and goes to the cross. And he's teaching them, he's praying for them, he's trying to prepare them for everything that's about to happen. Um, and this, John 16, is, is um, a big part of that. Okay, And so he's been teaching and they've been sort of um, doing what we can't do tonight, uh, that is, interact live with one another. They've been asking him some things, and he's been responding and so forth. And we're going to jump right in the middle of one of those exchanges because he had been using some illustrations, some figures of speech to make his point, and uh, he changes his tactic in the middle of chapter 16 and, and speaks more plainly, you might say, to them. And they say, oh... Finally, you're, you're not talking in figures of speech, but you're talking plainly. That's, that's in verse 25 of John 16. Uh, but we're going to pick up at verse 31 uh, to get to, to our point. But again, this is the night before the cross, and he's preparing these guys for everything that's, that's to come. Not only in uh, the, the coming few days, which is going to be bad enough, the... the uh, crucifixion of Jesus, his burial, and, and then, of course, his resurrection on Sunday, and then the days after that. But really, long term, he's trying to prepare them uh, for everything that's to come. Uh, look what he says, beginning in verse 31. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Uh, Jesus sort of is doing some prophesying even in this statement. Because, you know, he, he tells them, uh, we're right at the hour where a lot of this stuff is going to begin to happen. Uh, you're going to be scattered. So what happens when Jesus is arrested? If you read the gospel accounts, when Jesus is arrested in the garden, the guys scatter. And when Jesus goes to the cross, only John, uh, among the closest disciples, is at the cross. Everybody else is hiding, and they're in hiding for many days. Uh, and so he predicts that here. You will be scattered there in verse 32, uh, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. So they're going to abandon him in what we might say is his greatest time of need. His closest followers leave him all alone, okay? Bad situation. If you were leading a group of people like this and had been working with them and training them and teaching them, and then suddenly you're arrested unjustly, falsely accused, they're getting ready to put you to death, and everybody leaves you, everybody scatters, that is tough times, isn't it? That's difficult. We would be hard-pressed in the way we normally think of it to call that a time of peace, a peaceful time. Yet, look what Jesus says. Right after he says, you're all going to leave me alone, he says, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. See, Jesus, of course, knew the key to peace. What is the key to peace? It's not 
the absence of something that is in Jesus' situation. It's not that they don't arrest him, they don't slap him around, they don't beat him, they don't crucify him. All those things are going to happen. That is not what peace is. What is peace to Jesus? He says, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. Peace is not the absence of something, it's the presence of someone. For Jesus, it was the presence of the Father. Um, the Father was with him through all of that. He could have peace through all of that because the Father was with him. We, we remember the one moment on the cross where he seems to express a sense of an abandonment. Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, but throughout this time, he, he clearly feels the presence of the Father throughout this process, even though everybody else left him, you see. He could have peace. He knew the key to peace. And this, this passage, this story, really uh, expresses what I'm trying to get across uh, as a biblical view of what peace is. And uh, if you come out of tonight's session with one thing, I, I hope you get this, that peace is about presence, not absence. And you can be in the midst of anything and have peace if the right person is with you. For Jesus, it was the Father. I am not alone, he says, for the Father is with me. And then he goes on, he says, and I, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation. He wasn't going to take them out of all that tribulation that they were going to experience, but he promised to be with them. And as long as they had him, they could have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And that's, he, he says, that this is why I'm saying these things to you, so you can understand. I don't know how soon they picked up on that. It doesn't seem like they really got it until after Jesus was raised. And then there seems to be a change. They finally figure out what it means that Jesus has overcome the world. And so they could have peace. Uh, where would the disciples find peace in all the tribulation and turmoil and trouble that was to come? In Jesus. In Jesus. They, they would find peace. Last text for tonight. 20th chapter of John. So when we go to the 20th chapter, we're now after the crucifixion, all right? In fact, we're after the resurrection. In that time after the resurrection where Jesus is appearing to various people and different groups um, and encouraging them, building them up. So John chapter 20, uh, beginning in verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, which we understand was Sunday. On the evening of the first day of the week, Sunday evening, the doors being locked. Notice uh, we're going to keep finding these guys behind locked doors. Um, not making a statement about whether we should lock our doors in our neighborhoods. Uh, but they're locked away behind doors, just like they probably have been since the moment Jesus was arrested, okay? Sunday evening, resurrection day, he comes. Doors are locked. The disciples are there. Why are they locked? For fear of the Jews, it says. Jesus came, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Just reading down through verse 22 here. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. So you remember this appearance where Jesus suddenly appears with them behind these locked doors and his opening words, of course, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. And he says it twice. Um, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And then one other verse in this same chapter 
it takes place eight days later. So on what Monday of the following week, full week has passed since the resurrection. All right, so we're on, uh, we're past the, the second Lord's day. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, they're still locking the doors. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he has his famous interchange with, with Thomas. But I just read through those two stories um, that you're probably very familiar with to ask this question. What is it that gave the disciples and then Thomas peace despite the fact that they were afraid? They're still locking the doors. They're still hiding away for fear of the Jews. I mean, they killed the, the rabbi, the master teacher, Jesus. Surely they're going to try and wipe out his disciples. That's got to be their fear. So the, the fear is not gone yet, all right? But they're able to have peace. Why is that? Because of the presence of Jesus. Jesus appears among them. He Two times, the first time says, peace be with you. And then the second time, eight days later, uh, especially for Thomas, who we call doubt, Doubting Thomas, uh, he says, peace be with you. And so they're reminded that the presence of Jesus is what peace is, not the absence of trouble. And, um, and so in all four of these, uh, passages that we've looked at, two from Luke, two from John. I hope we're seeing the, the basic message, which I think is really important because it, it it contradicts a lot of what we've often thought about when we've been asked to define peace. You know, peace is the absence of war, absence of struggle or conflict. Actually, Jesus taught the disciples on multiple occasions that it wasn't the absence of a storm or people trying to kill them, or difficult times. Peace was his presence. Peace is the presence of the Lord, and not necessarily the absence of these other things. And when we understand that, we, we realize that we can, we can have peace despite circumstances in our lives, whatever they might be, that are troubling us. He hasn't promised to always take those things away, you see. That might be troubling to us in itself. This is a terrible thing going on in my life. Why not take it away? Well, he may in time, and again, he may not. We can still have peace because peace is about the presence of the Lord and not necessarily the absence of what's bothering us. That's where I wanted us to start this week, okay? To think in those basic terms. Some other things we're gonna do, um, you know, this word peace is used not only in the New Testament as we've seen tonight, but throughout the Bible. There's a couple of Old Testament words that are translated peace that I want us to study and, and see how those carry into the new as well. Um, the one is one that you're probably pretty familiar with, the, the word shalom. Uh, but then it's very interesting that there's another word which comes from uh, a familiar name that we run into the Old Testament. Did you know that, that Noah, Noah's name, uh, is related to the concept of peace? Uh, peace, rest, nuah, Noah. Uh, so that'll be an interesting study, I hope, as we look at that. But we'll We'll continue next week. I think one of the places we'll start in next week is in uh, John 14 um, as we continue to develop this. So um, I should read through these, these texts again and, and see if we have understood them correctly tonight and, and uh, hope the study is a blessing to you. Let's pray together for a moment as we, as we conclude. Holy God, thank you for always hearing us when we call upon you and, and being a true presence in our lives. 
uh, despite our distractions and the storm that may at times swirl around us, help us to understand we can have peace because you are with us. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior, who gave his all for us. Help us to learn more and more each day how to give ourselves for him and how to serve him faithfully and how to share him with others. Pray your blessings of comfort and, and strength and endurance and peace on all those who uh, are a part of this study. And thank you for your love in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You all be well. We'll see you soon.